Hey there, you're about to watch another wonderful episode of Wild Harvest. Now, of course, I will show you some tricks and some tips for local foraging and the gathering of wild edibles. But the reality is, and the truth is, you must do your own homework. There is no replacement for learning and gaining the experience and knowledge that will give you 100% accuracy on touching and picking and eating the wild edibles. And the only way to do that is to turn to the books, turn to the material online, and most importantly, Find a good, experienced, and knowledgeable local forager and take a course with them. Then you'll be confident in your own wild harvest. All right, let's go enjoy some gathering. Mountain Willow. I can't eat this, but I can make tea out of it, especially if I get a headache. It's going to help a lot. Moose. Love it. These are the foothills of the Rocky Mountains just outside of Calgary, Alberta. And it is astoundingly beautiful. There's a dozen reasons why people come out here. If it's in the winter, maybe snowmobiling, snowshoeing. In the summer, mountain biking. They hunt, they fish out here. Or just simply trek out here amongst this beauty, just soaking it all in. The fact is, you can also eat a lot of it. My job is to gather, dig up, search for, pick, hunt, fish, and forage just about everything I can get in this location. And Chef Paul's job, well, his job might be a little more challenging. He needs to find the culinary potential in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Well, I want to take you up to the bottom. Here. This is the good stuff. This is sphagnum moss. And even traditionally, Aboriginal cultures use this as their diapers. They would actually wrap the babies in this. It actually has healing antiseptic properties to it. And as you can see, once you start getting into it, it's deep out. and moist. I mean, it's the best toilet paper, but it's also good uh, for wounds. God, it's just a great, I love this moss, my favorite. These are horsetail. So this is all about right place, right time now. I was getting a bit worried because we are so close to more alpine type areas that it's just we're too early in the season. But what's too early for one plant is perfect for another. And if we actually were here later, it's going to become very fibrous and horrible to eat. But right now, these are the, the sprouts of the forest and they're delicious. So look around, gather up as many of these as you can and pick them, don't pull them out because you want to leave the root system, but pick them off because this is basically like uh, the fruit. We're eating the fruit of the plant. We're lucky, I, I think, just to be here at this moment to see these. This is the first fruit. Yeah, have a taste, have a taste. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. The beauty of this plant is that it's abundant, not only here, but around the world. So gathering it in large amounts for the plates that you might want to make is going to be a fine idea. We're not going to be hurting the environment. This is also the beauty of gathering wild edibles. The both of us have to get down on our hands and knees. And when you do that, you feel the earth, you smell the earth, you brush up against plants you may have never even seen before. It is a powerful way to connect to nature. Next question is, how does it cook? Like, does it shrink down into a noodle? Does it stay the way it is? Um, how much heat is too much heat, and will the flavor change? I 
I'm sure if this mosque could tell a story, it would have many. I'd like to take it with me. I don't think I'm gonna cook with it, but it will definitely be part of the visual aspect of my dish. You may come to an area where it is just profuse with a plant that you love to pick and eat. That's fine, but be really careful how you do it, because if you start gathering with both hands and putting them in the, into a bag, you may be gathering up poisonous plants with it. So you've got to make sure that you've identified the plant correctly and that you're only picking the one that you want. It's a time of year, elevation, soil content, moisture in the soil, everything plays a part when it comes to what you're going to find that you can actually eat depending on where you're walking, where you are. Right now at this elevation, I think Paul and I are a little bit early and even these tips seem very young. I wanna get something that's a little further along. So I think I'm going to get Paul and head down to a lower elevation. Paul. Hey, Paul. Now this is where identification becomes tricky for me. I'm used to what I know in various places around the planet. And this, some of this area is new to me. So wood sorrel in Ontario looks a lot more like clover, actually. But if I'm recognizing this right... I think you are right, Les. Oh, that's good. If, if if people have not tasted the beauty of sorrel, they need to because, wow. <clears throat> this is, so this is one of those flavors that's very difficult to come by in a forest like this. It's sour. Yeah. I love sour. I could suck on lemons all day, and this tastes like lemon to me. I have this growing in the garden at the restaurant, and we use it this time of year. We never cook it. We always use it fresh, as it's chopped up maybe a little bit, because of its citrus tang. Uh, and most people are blown away because they've never had a flavor like that before. Mm -hmm. This doesn't look like wood sorrel in Ontario. Not even close, but it tastes the same. It's the same plant family. But out here, it looks like this. And this is why you can't just assume that if there's a plant named blank in your neighborhood that you can eat, you go across the, the globe or the other side of the continent or even just to a new region, and there's a plant with the very same name that it's going to be edible. That one could be poisonous. It happens all the time. You have to actually research these things and, and get into the, the scientific names of the plants so that you know you're eating the right one. Oh, this is good. This, I don't think this is gonna be enough to bring back to the plate, so. Let's just eat it. Just gonna eat it. Okay. This is good. Here we go, here we go. Come here, Paul. This little gem is fireweed. Now, I want you to imagine something. How often have we seen that news story, uh, you know, feel-good story of the chef that goes to the market, finds a special tuna, goes to the market, finds that perfectly marbled piece of meat? But how much more would it be profound and exceptional if that same chef had gone and met the cow, had watched the fish swim? You see, that's what I'm trying to do for you here right now. Chef... Meet the plant. I'm bringing you right to where this fireweed and the horsetail and whatever else we find, right to where it lives. This is, its life cycle is carried out here every single day of the year. And you have the opportunity to meet it at its home. These leaves are very tender. I can feel them with my fingers that they're really tender. But the stalk is, is somewhat woody. I can snap it. And a little crunchy. They almost have a spinach characteristic to it. I know what Paul needs. He needs a fire that'll maintain its heat so he can cook on it. And the wind is cutting around the corner and whipping right across here, which is just gonna blow all the heat away and make cooking a lot more difficult. So. 
Real simple windbreak, that's all I'm doing. Yeah, better. As I'm cleaning them, I'm finding that they're not all created equally. Some are at a different stage of their life cycle. Uh, I'm assuming that the older, older ones are more fibrous and woody and a little bit dry. Um, I definitely have to think of a different preparation method for those. And to be honest, the next time I'm, I'm out picking them, I might pass on those ones and just go for the, the younger, more tender ones. I am cleaning fireweed. The crown has a certain opportunity, the leaves have an opportunity, and quite possibly it could be the stalk, the stem that is the star of the show. Where I thought I was going to extract flavor out of these horsetails, once they wilted, I, I found them to really absorb flavor, which I guess I should have known because they're so neutral. But herein lies the presentation opportunity. They've got texture, they've got character. And these are the ones that I thought were the challenge. I know what to do with the other ones, but these ones are a pleasant surprise. I'm gonna try and keep those ones dry. Some of this beautiful fireweed. Those are the fireweed tops and some horsetail, all in its natural form. Canola, apple cider, vinaigrette, not too much, but I'm hoping adds a little bit of pizzazz to the show is some of the grilled fireweed stem. Mm, mm. And this is the cooked. That's cooked. Um, you can stay. Hey, I'm so, Rolled right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right here. Well, reality is I don't need to teach you what this plant is, do I? Seen it a lot. You know, I think the dandelion is a very much maligned wild edible. I mean, we can eat every part of it at one time or another. And that's, that's a thing that I wanted to get you to grasp as well while we're walking around here. The growing cycle is going to be uh, unique to where we are right now. I would bet in 48 hours we won't be able to have much of these yellow flowers they'll start to go and go to seed but right now it's perfect for two things the flower and the root so when you harvest you want to get right down low and I mean really down low I'm hoping I'm not going to break it off here that's why I'm using my knife in this situation I'm reaching down in and what I want from you as much as possible is all the yellow tops and at root. So once again, like you did with the horsetail and like you did with the fireweed, I want you to get to know the dandelion. Really get to know it. Sit with it for a while, check out the texture. You're the one who's got to make a masterpiece of it in terms of putting it on the plate. Uh, I'm just bringing you to it. So I'll go harvest as well. I use dandelions at the restaurants. The dandelion flowers I will use to color vinegars. Um, sometimes I'll blend them into uh, a cream and make an ice cream out of them, dehydrate them, and use them for tea. Hey, Paul. Come on over. Take a look at this. These are spruce tips that we affectionately call them. You see a little paper part, just don't worry about that. Brush that off. And this again is all about right place, right time. Right now, this is the right place and the right time for gathering these. Mm, here, go ahead and have a taste already. Pop that in. 
citrus bomb. It's packed with vitamin C. Mm. This is the last plant that I'm going to lead you to today. All right, I'm going to head back to camp and I will wait for you there. You know, I've spent a lifetime now traveling out in all kinds of wilderness areas throughout the world. And along the way, I've eaten just about everything there is to eat. Normally to stay alive, well, this isn't about survival now. This is about thriving. Because bringing Paul out here with me gives me an opportunity to take all of my harvesting, my gathering, my digging, my catching, all of that, and bring it to the next level. And ultimately, deepen my connection to nature. That's what we can all do out here. We always have the opportunity to deepen our connection to nature, unless we don't go out into it. <sighs> I'll show you what I've got. I've got a beautiful loon just sitting in front of me, just dancing away in the sunset. There he is, look at that, look at that, look at that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm gonna gather a few other edibles here, and I can easily grab them. I hope. Come on, come on. Yeah. I get a couple of those. Everything seems to be about you know, time and place, and you have to be in the right place at the right time. This cattail, in probably just another week or two from now, will be kind of woody and fibrous and not very tasty to eat. This is the time to gather. All right, my friend. Hello, hello. Have you ever had cattail? No, never. This part here is delicious. So take a bite, have a taste, and then you decide how you want to utilize it. Just like that. Just take a bite off the end. That is fun. That's good, eh? Unexpected. What I'm thinking might surprise you. It's a different taste, isn't it? We nicknamed it in survival Nature Supermarket because if you're starving and you come across a cattail swamp, you're eating for a long time and it's really healthy and it's got a lot of nutrients and starch. So I'm gonna leave this to you, you decide what to do. I'm gonna go gather some more firewood, help keep your fire going. Sun's going down, it's dinner time. All right. After a day of gathering some really incredible ingredients, I thought that, you know, it'd be kind of fun to have sort of a batter fest using some delicious beer and flour, so just two ingredients. I don't really wanna change the flavor profile of the things that I'm gonna deep fry. I think I'm gonna use some of this dandelion vinegar that I made. That should go really well. I'm gonna add a little bit of soy to that as well. I'm gonna try a little experiment. I'm going to see if I can roast up these dandelion roots. And if I can get them dry and brittle, I'll crush them up and make us some dandelion root coffee. Right now I'm bringing the spruce bog to the lake. And I've got the influence of the spruce with the spruce tips. I've got the moss, I've got the horsetails, and I'm gonna prepare the horsetails two different ways. But 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Paul. Wow. That's all I got to say is wow. I'm going to sneak one too. Paul, that's amazing. That's fantastic. I've been kind of ruminating, if you will, on the two of us being out here and why we're here and this end goal that we both have of making our connection to nature deeper. And for me, what I've discovered in this time with you is that I bring you out here and I'm working to expand and, and bring a, a great bit of depth to your connecting to the land, to nature. But then you're taking it to this next level and enabling me to take years of just grabbing and eating in a matter of survival and bring it to a whole new level and a level of not only just appreciation, which is easy to say, but actually a level of connecting to nature. Thank you. This is fantastic. You know, in situations like these, Paul, you're being challenged in ways that no other chef is being challenged. What you've just done, Paul, is you've created a one-of-a-kind, once upon a time, Chef Paul creation that will not be equaled ever again. Why not? Because we are here now in this place and in this time, and nothing will be at this stage again until maybe roughly this day next year. So this has created a depth of connecting to the land that uh, we, we can't, we just can't equal any other way. Thank you. Second course, I'm thinking dandelion. I'm gonna do more of a, a deep fried cake. Honestly, this I did not expect. Full disclosure, I've eaten dandelion before. Pick it, eat it. But in the hands of Chef Paul, this has become a masterpiece. This is, what do we want to say here? Um, think of a, a, a latka extraordinaire. It's just this incredible combination of the greenery, the dandelions with the spruce tips, and the aioli sauce, and the batter. Mm. This cannot be equaled anywhere else but right here, right now. For the final dish, I think I'm going to make a batter. This is going to be a dessert concept for the cattail that Les brought me. I've never ever worked with cattail before. This is my very first time. I don't think I've experienced anything like it. Very, very simple dish. It's about crisp, it's about sweet. I did add a little bit of a surprise for Les. I took the roasted dandelion root that he had made and sprinkled some of it right on top. Bit of a crunch, and more importantly, a little bit bitter. The end game is that this is what harvesting from the wild is all about. It's not weird. It's not groveling for little tiny tidbits. It's having flavor explosions and experiences for your palate that you cannot equal anywhere else.